may be seated. We'll just do like uh, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and um, I will begin to pray. Luke chapter 4, quickly. Just like I said tonight, it, it's a different night. When I'm done with the teaching, then I will pray for the sick. When I finish praying for the sick, we'll take a few testimonies. After the testimonies, then I will ask the Lord for permission. If you will grant me the permission to release your blessing. If he does, most times he does. Then we'll start from here. If your heart is open, you'll receive it. Okay, let's go. Um, Luke chapter 4, from verse 31 to 36. And once again... Um, as the teaching is going on, you might find some eruptions. It's part of the, of the process. Eruptions. Just stay focused, okay? All right. Verse 31 of Luke chapter 4. And came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine. For his word was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. And cried out with a loud voice. Saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. Verse 36 is my emphasis, and it is a commentary, is a reaction of what happened. And they were all amazed. And spake among themselves saying, What a word is this? I was expecting that when they said, What a word is this? Then they would have said that the revelation that Jesus downloaded that was so fantastic. But in their commentary of the word that they claimed to have received, they said, for with authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits and the comma. So it was not a revelation. When they say, what a word. They saw the demonstration, the manifestation of the utensils that is normally used to enforce the will of the kingdom of God. So according to this presentation, we have two utensils that are used to enforce the will of God. Can you identify them? Number one is? Number two is? So there are two basic utensils that are used to establish and to enforce the will of God. The first happens to be authority, and the second happens to be power. The purpose of this lecture this evening is to show you the difference between authority and power. And then when we are done with the um, theoretical session, we, if, if time allows, we'll now do a practical session. Do you, will, will you allow that? You know, I don't want someone to take me to court and say, we went, I want to know that I have your permission. So all our white brothers and sisters, uh, 
All right. So we'll do the theoretical part and we'll proceed and do the practical part. But I'd like you to understand the theoretical part adequately. Are you with me? Oh, you're not with me again. I'd like you to understand the, practical, the theoretical part adequately so that when we move into the practical part, you can identify the oppression and know if it is power or it is authority at work. We will do the practicals just for a few minutes, then we'll go to the miracle service. Is that clear? All right, so if you came with a jotter, something to write on, a diary that you take your notes on, I would like you to draw a column, something like this. And then on this side, you put power, and on the other side, you put authority. So that we can compare and contrast for you to know what power is and what authority is. Because I want to end my lecture tonight by saying, ye shall receive power. Just like Jesus said. <laughs> All right, so if you go to the power side, the power side, are you there with me in the power side? Let me use a scripture to introduce the power side. And that scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. I want to call on the technical people to join me in this journey so that you give me the scriptures I'm asking for. We'll spend less time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is not in word. That is to say that the kingdom of God is so real, so powerful, and the only utensil that can illustrate the reality of the kingdom of God is power. So power is the utensil that is used as an illustration of the kingdom of God. You know, those days when we did elementary biology, the lecturer, the teacher, will illustrate with a diagram. And if you want to illustrate kingdom things, the tool you use for illustration is called power. So except we are able to manifest power, we do not adequately illustrate the potency of the kingdom of our God. So that's a scripture for power before we go into the differentials. Hallelujah. If you check 1 Corinthians chapter 15, from verse 22 to 25, I'm not going to read that, you will see the place of authority in the kingdom of which we speak. Authority is a proof that you are the endorsed functionary of heaven. Anytime you find someone claiming to be a functionary from heaven, and he doesn't have heaven's authority to back up his claim, he is a fraud. And I say that with boldness, because that's the position of the scripture. Anyone that claims to be sent by God, the proof that you come from heaven is that there will be an endorsement of heaven upon your life, which is the authority of God. So you might go to, you know, the other day I met a sister I met a sister and she took me to a, a, a certain designer that I like. So I buy their shoes. I don't want to mention it so that you will not go and empty their shops. So I buy their shoes. I like their shoes. By the time I got into the real designer shop, because that's what you have in London, I found out that all the copies I bought were fake. Because I saw the, ah, the original ones. Ah. In the same way, many people have masqueraded to be sent by God. Mm. <laughs> and the proof, I saw the original copy of the one I bought in Nigeria. In fact, I, I just moved away from there. I just moved away. <laughs> because I, I, when I bought the shoe, I said, man, this is expensive. So when I saw the original one, I saw the, 
the prior. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> so instantly I knew that the product I was masquerading with was not the original. And it is possible for people to also claim that they were sent by God and the proof that God sent them is this utensil called authority. It was Jesus' authority that separated him from the Pharisees. The Pharisees were teachers and scholars in their own right. Don't forget that. But when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. And I was expecting Nicodemus, having accepted that Jesus came from God. And if you check Nicodemus' statement, he said, Rabbi, hallelujah. He said, we know. So Nicodemus was sent by a clique, by a club, by a company in the Sanhedrin to extend some form of accreditation to Jesus. And he came in this wise and said, we, this clique I represent in the Sanhedrin, have come to the conclusion of the fact that you are a teacher come from God. And I was expecting him to roll out some of the doctrines that Jesus taught that is in compatibility with their philosophy. He didn't do any of that. He said, we know you are a teacher come from God because no one can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So Nicodemus was saying that these miracles are authentications that you derive from God. Because we ourselves, in our own right, as scholarly, we are teachers in our own respect, but no one can reproduce these miracles that you have to show. It means you derive from God. We may derive from theological schools, but you come from God. First thing I want to tell you about power is that it is gift-based. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, He shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. It's a gift. No one worked for power. It is gift-based. In the eyes of Jesus, in order for you to prosecute natural life, you need power. And that's why the Bible says in the book of Mark chapter 16, it says, This sign shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. In my name they shall speak in new tongues. In my name they shall pick up, drink deadly things. It will have no power over them. Perspective of Jesus about normal life is that normal life is prosecuted supernaturally with the agency of power. And so God made every one of his child a custodian of his power. And that's how you know them that believe in my name. Power is gift-based. Whereas power is gift-based, authority is relationship-based. Matthew chapter 3, verse 14. Mark, sorry, chapter 3, verse 14. Mark, chapter 3, verse number 14. I wish that the technical people can help me. The Bible says, and he ordained 12. What's their job description? That there should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. How many of you have ever been to a restaurant that has a waiter? You've experienced that before? Right. So when you go to a restaurant and you find, you see a waiter has a bow tie waiting to serve. That's his duty. His duty is to be available in the restaurant. But whether or not he serves is dependent on whether customers come or not. Is that true? His real assignment is to be available. And even if there are no customers available, he is available. He reported to work. And just in case customers come, then he is released to serve. 
Now, in the apostolic company, the, the assignment of the disciple is to be with Jesus. That is his preoccupation. That is his assignment. And you will notice in this presentation that the Bible says he ordained the twelve, and the reason for which he ordained them was to be with him. That's their primary assignment. And then when you see the other assignment, which has to do with, no, go back to the scripture. Go back to the scripture. Don't be creative. Oh, technical man. Just remain there. Hallelujah. He said, let them be with me. And you notice the, the word he used. He said, and that he might. That's a probability. It's not part of the business. He might send them to preach. That means he can decide not to send you to preach. So you remain being with him. You see, he's sending you to preach is a means by which he's delegating authority on your life to represent him. That is optional. So whenever you see someone that has authority with God, he was, first of all, with him. And that's where he got the authority. When he was assigned to do something, it was from thence that Jesus now conferred upon him the authority to represent his name. So if I've never been with him, you can never have his authority. And that's why many pastors today have gone to join the cult. Because they don't want to be with Jesus and they like the honor of being celebrated as people of power. I don't want to trouble you with stories. <laughs> ah. mm. Let's just leave that matter. Let's leave. Some of the people you celebrate, they are not from God. Though. You know, we know them. You see them on the screen. We know them in the area. <laughs> they, they have not been with Jesus. But the fact that they were not with Jesus doesn't mean they were not with something else. They actually went to be with something. And the thing that they went to be with gave them some ability to represent the thing. And many people confuse their manifestations with the workings of the Holy Spirit. Every man that has been with Jesus can tell you his story. I was in Lagos. I told you that I had money to buy cars. Every month I am paid my salary. It's huge enough for me to walk into a car shop and buy a car. And for seven years, Jesus we say no. So I used, those of you that know Lagos, I used those yellow buses for seven years. And, uh, do you realize that most of the iconic revelations that I got, I got them in those yellow buses in Lagos. Somebody saw me hopping on one of the buses to, to, to make it to work, and the person was ashamed for me. Hey, man, no come. Ah. He didn't know. He didn't know that I found security in Christ. It doesn't matter what I ride. What matters is what rides me. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> for seven years. was in the buses. And those of you that have seen the double-decker buses of, of, of London, if you see these buses I'm talking about, you will pray for me. You, you would have prayed. But I was in it for seven years and it did not add to the sense of my being, not diminish my essence because I was with him. You know, a lot of us draw the sense of our being from maybe what you drive, the kind of Salary that comes into your account at the end of the month. You don't understand what I'm talking about. The moment you, you are with Jesus, Jesus will show you the things that bother him, the things that he considers to be important. That's when you find out that the things that are important from the perspective of God are not things that are important from the perspective of men. There are so many changes in your philosophy that will take place when you stay around Jesus. 
He will make out of you uh, such a person that this world will look at and give him an ugly name. Say, no, you are a Jew. Because my colleagues could not explain how I did not have a car. One of them bought, bought a car, a Mercedes-Benz to turn out to ML 2012 edition, and he, 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 he gave me a lift and asked me, what are you doing with money? We, see, this kind of, I just got this now. I'm looking great in it. And you need to use public transportation. You know, he, he was an unbeliever, so there was no way I could educate him that I have a master. And my master is the one that regulates not just the way, what I say, he also regulates how I spend. Every aspect of my life is under his government. And it happens to be that if in the government of Jesus Christ, he has not yet regulated your spending, he is very likely you serve mammon. Because there are two entities that Jesus said have the capacity to draw human worship, and it is God or and So a lot of the influence of his government is going to be experienced in your financial space. Because if we print out your statement of account, we can actually trace your God from it. Uh, I don't want to go. You don't like being with him. so they were, they, He ordained them to be with him that he might, which is optional, send them to preach. And it's in the sending to preach that he gives you authority to represent him. That's what we call delegated authority. So if your authority is authentic, it means that he came on you because you were with him. Exactly? You get that? All right. So people that have authority don't need to boast. I was preaching in Port Harcourt. Those of you that know Port Harcourt, you know, it can rain any time. And I was, it was a crusade, massive crusade. And the opportunity had not yet come for me to give the altar call. And something like rain started falling. Jesus Christ. I pointed to the sky and commanded, hey! And the thing stopped. I need to finish preaching first. When I finished preaching, I went to my hotel room and he whispered, whispered to me, level it down. He said, when you stop it like that, and you finish doing what you are doing, release it. I said, oh, I went, I said, hey, come back. <laughs> he came back. Yeah. Mm. It's not only the weather that obeys. So many things will obey because you came from him. So number two, power is boisterous. Power is very noisy. So whenever power is manifesting, you will know because it's noisy, it's, boi it's boisterous. It's like, it's like an explosive. Boosh! That's how power is. But you see, authority is silent because authority is judicial. Have you ever, if you, if you go to the court of law, you will find justice being dispensed. Nobody is shouting, but somebody is going to jail. <laughs> no shout. There's a lot of decorum. You don't need to raise your voice because justice is potent without shouting. At the end of sessions, the judge will say, you are going for 22 years in imprisonment. And he'll be saying it stammering, but it is, it is binding. No one is shouting in the court of law. But the impact of the outcome is binding. So authority is judicial and power is boisterous. Now let me show you that power is boisterous because I know you don't believe that. Acts chapter 8 from verse 5 and 6. This is evangelist Philip that goes to Samaria. And this was the report of his outing. Acts 6. Acts 6 verse 5 and 8. Then Philip went. No. Okay. Let me go back. Acts 8 verse 5 and 6. Sorry. Acts 8 verse 5 and 6. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preach Christ unto them. 
And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. Very boisterous. There was audio and there was video. So anytime power is on the display, you will see audio. Hallelujah. Now, you know, I, I know most of you are not used to um, power. But we can't do power without audio. You will hear a shout that is not consistent with the decorum that is in the room. Power has capacity to disrupt. It will disorganize so that it can reorganize. That's how power is. It's very loud, very boisterous. But authority is judicial. Are you still with me? Okay, let me show you how I came about the fact that authority is judicial. I got that from Luke chapter 13, from verse 11 to verse 16. Authority is judicial. Authority is what? Can't hear you. I say authority is what? And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answering with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to walk. In them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And listen, because someone was questioning the activity of goodwill that Jesus did, and Jesus pro provided a scriptural defense for his actions. I'd like you to take a note, take a moment and note Jesus' defense for his actions. Then the Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite. Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath day lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? This is defense. He said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years be loose from Abraham? This bound on the Sabbath day. Now listen. Jesus was operating as a law enforcement agent in this scripture. You know, I told you that authority is judicial. Oh my, you are not with me. Have you ever seen a law enforcement agent? The reason why the police has authority is because there's a law that backs them up to do the things they do. So Jesus is a law enforcement agent in this scripture and he provides the provision, the statutory provision that empowers him to act irrespective of the day of the week that it is. He said, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound low these 18 years, be loosed from this bound on the Sabbath day? It means that Satan had no right to bind the woman, but unfortunately, Satan found a reason to bind her, and he is a law enforcement agent, and he has figured that that bondage is illegal, and acting in his capacity as a law enforcement agent, he told the woman, thou art loose from thy infirmity, and the demon that, that, that bound the woman had no authority in the face of Jesus' rebuke. You see, there's a judicial situation here because he was questioned. And the question that questioned him was as though it was out of legality for him to have done that on the Sabbath day. And uh, he said, just like you um, lose your ox from 
the stall and take it to water it on the Sabbath day. Do you do that? The man couldn't deny. In fact, he, I think he did it before he came to the synagogue. <laughs> he said, ought not this way. She said, daughter of Abraham. You could lose your ass. Your ass. And the daughter of Abraham is bound. In, in, in the situations of losing things, every day is preferable. And Jesus brought defense for his activity. And all of the defense he gave was a judicial defense, suggestive of the fact that authority is judicial in nature. It's not boisterous, but it's effective. Did you get it? I said, did you get it? It's obvious that many people didn't get it. So, because you are not getting it, we'll cut one off the, we'll reduce the syllabus. Power is the principle by which God conquers, just in case there is a place that is heavily infested by demonic activity and God wants to overpower that, that the constituency of the kingdom of darkness, what he does is that he releases power. Maybe there's a covenant. Many witches have been meeting for many years and they initiated their children to continue uh, uh, you know, the act and they have laid siege over the territory, laid siege over the, the whole place. Their government will be intact as long as there is no power. So if God wants to conquer a place, what he does is that he releases. So power is the principle by which God conquers. But authority is the principle by which God rules. So the day you gave your life to Christ, it was as though the Holy Ghost was knocking on the door. Ah! No. When, when, when we are done with the service, go to YouTube. You will find the message. Make up your notes. Make, I know you are hungry, but you are here for, for something else. See, I missed three windows already because he was not there. Three windows. I would have stopped this message since. It's when we come for teaching and we know that the reason why we are here for teaching, we'll shut the windows and then we'll travel with the teaching anointing and expound the truth of the word of God. And you go back heavy, full of weight. And the deception that used to fall to previously to come your way and you, you will not even notice it. Authority is judicial. The day you gave your life to Christ, Jesus came by his spirit and he was knocking at the door of your heart. You felt uneasy, you felt convicted, and then you said, yes, Lord. And you gave him the right of way to penetrate your heart and to establish his command tower therein. You will not feel that knock again because he has accomplished the purpose for the knock. Now, he begins to rule that space. You hear? It was by faith that you appropriate the, uh, appropriated the benefits that were contained in the grace of God unto your salvation. But the Bible says that it is by grace that we are saved, but it is faith that makes what grace brought available to us our possession. So you stumbled upon salvation by an act of your faith. But if you are going to grow in that which you secured through your faith, you will have to grow by obedience because the principle of his government, the principle of, govern, of governance is, is authority. So if you are going to grow in God, you must recognize that the Holy Spirit that convicted you on the crusade ground is worthy to be obeyed now. You got in by faith, you grow by obedience. Is that clear? So any believer that is here that doesn't want to begin to practice obedience is not going to go anywhere with God until 
you consider the Holy Spirit worthy of obedience, you will never see his glory. And just like Jesus was able to sleep in, in Peter's boat comfortably, the Holy Ghost can sleep in your life. Maybe we'll do school of prophets here. Then I show you the step-by-step -step principles you need to put in place. How you need to order your lifestyle so that the spiritual capital that God gave you can begin to control your space. That's when you will know what power is. Oh, which is, which is gathered in the night. You know, I, I, there was a place I used to preach. I was a missionary in, the, in northern Nigeria. So we came to church one evening. And the Holy Ghost arrested one lady. And she began to confess that her and her people gathered together to kill me. And when they came in the spirit, there were two angels standing by my side like, like uh, do you know fluorescent tubes? They were giving off light, light like fluorescent tubes. And none of them could come close. I didn't, know, I didn't even know that. But you know what? Authority can be silent. But it is majestic. <laughs> as I speak, as I speak in the name of Jesus, eh? as I speak in the name of Jesus, the power of darkness that holds people down will begin to lose their grip upon their lives. Saika bora malaka, saiko presku I was a rural preacher and in every respect I still am. So we used to cast out devils without the microphone. It took me two years to learn how to hold the microphone. Because when I'm preaching and I go hot, I forget that. I was supposed to be speaking. So when I see my brother Evans, I think I understand him perfectly. When you have too much fire in your vessel, it's difficult to coordinate. I, I learned coordination deliberately because I was an explosive device. There are some places you cannot survive except you are explosive. You must be at the edge of explosion at every point in time. That's how I survived the wilderness. Preach the gospel in demonic places, in darkness. Satan will rise up and he couldn't strike because we're secure in Jesus. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when I started preaching in the city, they said, no, this is not the kind of suit you wear. You need to, there are many types of suit. You have Hugo Boss, you have um, all kinds of uh, Ted Baker and uh, Tommy Hill figure. You need to. So they started trying to package me because I was <laughs> I was an explosive. <laughs> you know what? Whatever you do, please help me preach to your neighbor. Whatever you do, never be empty of fire. You see, he's already coming. He's already coming with his host. Mm, you see, oh my God, he wants to take over the whole service. So many things began to take place. When he knew he found he had no way, no entry point, he stirred up people. Stirred up people to begin to insult me, begin to lie against me. To begin to, I knew what they were doing and I gave Satan no chance. Do you know that they lied against me for seven years? And when I went back to the Lord, he said, don't make them important. I'm the only one important to you. So keep quiet. And in the incubator of anguish, that was where I received what 
is blessing you today. It was with bitter tears and cries. I had the ability to. He said, don't use my authority the wrong way. Don't use it the wrong way. You must learn meekness. My authority is not to kill people. It's to bless them. You must be a fountain that only gives forth sweet water. There should be no bitterness in your vessel. You must be like a, 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 a dove that has no gallbladder, no bitterness. It's not just about anointing. If, if you become powerful and the Holy Ghost doesn't regulate you, doesn't, you, are, you are a mistake about to explode. You are like Katrina. So before power comes upon your life, you must know the control room. How to adjust it. And the control room is the Holy Ghost. Don't trust anyone that is just explosive and he doesn't have self-control. The fruit of the Spirit are not manifested. No, he's a dangerous person. Whereas gifts are coveted, they can come in quickly. But fruits are cultivated. It takes time. It takes time for God to raise a true man, a proper man. Tonight, you will be worn your proper garment in the spirit. <laughs> oh. Before I end my lecture, I want to say one last statement. The Bible acknowledges that Satan has power, but it does not acknowledge his authority. That means Satan will only have authority over your life if you give him a place. And that's why Apostle Paul says, give Satan no place. Do you still remember? Jesus made a statement. He said, the prince of this world, he cometh. Why is he called the prince? Why prince? He used that word deliberately. The prince of this world cometh. Because a prince is a king that has no territory. He has no place to implement his authority, to exact it. So if you give Satan a place in your life, that place you give him becomes the place he has authority to rule. That's why my, uh, that's why I will not commit fornication because if I do I give him a place then he begins to rule that's why I will not steal because if I do I will give him a place and he will begin to rule that's why I will not take what is mine what is not mine because if I do I can enjoy it for a moment but it will give him a ground to find a platform to rule and to manipulate my system. I am a Puritan. Yes, a Puritan. It is God that is my obsession. There is nothing of this world that can bind my soul. Yes, while I was in the wilderness and I stayed there for long, for years, he refused to give me visibility and I refused to create open doors for myself. Because he's the one that knows when it is safe for me to step out. I started raising cripples years ago. Years ago. Yes, but he never released me from the place. So if I release you now, you will kill your neighbors. So stay in the incubator until my, my heart became tender. Then I now understood the rhythm of compassion. <laughs> Oh, he's some killer. And then when I now started liking the cave, he said, come and go now. Huh? Say, come and go. You will go to the United Kingdom. You will go to Ghana. You will go to South Africa. And you will proclaim the kingdom, the power, and the glory. That is the story of any true man that is fully baked under the hand of God. We know that thou art a teacher come from God because no one can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. 
So this is, I finished theory. Let me do practical just for five seconds. Five minutes. Okay, two minutes. I have your approval. All right. What I want to show you now is power. So what I will do here, I will just stand here. Then if I stand here for, for five minutes, power will begin to move from my body. I won't see anything. Power will begin to leave my body and affect these people. Maybe one or two of them. All right? And then you, you will know how power is. It, it, it is it's noisy. It's boisterous. When it acts, when it moves, it moves with so much energy. It can break things. It can destroy things. It can release things. It can remove things. So the power is coming. It's coming stronger. I sense it. It's surging. It's surging. It's searching, it's searching, it's searching, 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 searching. Uh, are you still in the lecture? Or you are not in the lecture? Stay in the lecture. That's why I don't wear my wedding ring. Because many people said it was a voodoo ring that I picked from Benin Republic. So I don't wear it. Are you still comfortable with me? So this is power. Are you? If I keep staying there, this row will, will, will not exist. This row will not exist. Um, Still talking about power. This is not my handkerchief. Eh? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Who, who has this? Ubore. Okay. So this is from Ubore. Power is transferable. Do you understand? It's transferable. Uh, let me consecrate one or one usher to be helping me. You have your duties, you have other duties now. Follow me. Carry this. Come. Oh. We didn't have the opportunity to try out our experiment. <laughs> Let me tell you, let me tell you something about power. When God moves in your life, never use it to project yourself. Never. If not, you'll be guilty of taking the glory of God. Do you understand that? Don't. This is me. Shall I prophesy? Shall I prophesy? That is. That is. Darkness. The reason for the power of God is not to project any man. It is to project Jesus. It, it is his it is advertisement for Jesus. Who am I? If, 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 if it were an election, okay, let's do an election so that somebody will win this anointing. I know I won't win. Yes, I know I won't win. So only one man should be exalted and his name is Jesus Christ. Like I said, power, yeah, it's a good place to clap. You. I see there. Where's my, you don't, you see, you don't like this job. You don't like this job. Huh? Remain with me. Put it on her. Just put it. So, power is transferable.
So if I keep this jacket and a thief steals it, he can't move. Thieves can visit maybe your house, not my own. Because when you, everything there has a link with power. <laughs> Are you with me? I am doing this so that you desire power. So this is power. Hey, give me. See, it's noisy. It's quite still. You know how to raise the dead? How many of you have ever cast out devils before you? You spoke to a demon? If you ever had authority to ask demons to leave, it's the same thing. You ask the spirit, go. In raising the dead, ask the spirit, come back. That's the same thing. The same authority by which you cast out devils, you can raise the dead. But the difference is this. Are you with me? You don't need to ask God before you cast out the devil. That's what we do. Anywhere you see a devil, you cast it out. But in raising the dead, he will need to be interested in raising that dead person. That's the difference. We cast out devils in mass. But you can only raise those that he wants to raise. Exactly. Oh, you are not with me. <laughs> so, if anyone dies around you, put your hand on the head. Ask the person to come out. Say it three times and stop. Go and sit down. You will see my velocity. I have I taught in a conference and taught people how to raise the dead. And they finished on the conference. And some of them believe me. We had things that if I tell you, you will not believe. So, this is power. Have you seen it? Or you want more? <laughs> it's just that this place is rugged. I would have done something, but it's rugged. I'll take this water, which they got from London. I didn't bring it from Nigeria. They got this one from London. I'll pour it on my hand and sprinkle it, and it will take out this, this section. But power is boisterous. You don't need to believe in Jesus. I will show you he lives. Yes. I will, we can go on this. I don't know if they will arrest me, but we can go on the street. You will see crippled people. I will receive their cane. They will walk on the streets. We don't need to pray about it. But I don't know if they will arrest me. And I, my wife is always checking on me after every session. You, that's the only reason why. You will, will take, you will see people, crippled people will start. It will, oh. So that's power. Now, see authority. I tell you by the gift of word of knowledge that I see two ladies in this congregation that are bound. I know you can't see them, but believe, just trust me, trust me. Huh? There are two ladies that are here and they are bound. I will give a verdict, just a verdict, from the court of heaven. And then we'll sit down and watch what will happen. That's authority. There's no way I can make what I say come to pass. Is it possible for me to make what I say come to pass. All right, so I'm telling you there are two ladies bound by the devil in this auditorium. Father, in the name of Jesus, those two ladies, arrest them. You know, I can't bring what I say to pass. Have you found them? You, you found only one? Two. Okay. How did I know there were two? That's a gift. And that's not for this lecture. Bring them. I need to cast out the 
break the yoke because they don't believe. Satan, release your captive. Release your captive. Release your captive. You don't say more than that. That one word you have spoken is still effective. captive so sometimes when you are casting out a devil it will so don't talk again let's allow her that word is still effective authority Authority goes into the realm of the spirit and causes a displacement. Power comes from the realm of the spirit into the natural and causes a change here. Authority goes there, causes a change, and then the change will become evident for everybody to see. Let me take you further. The demon is here. Put your hand here. Pray in tongues. This one can't sleep. Lay hands on her head. Pray in tongues. Can you see that? So he gives us two utensils. He gives us power. And he gives us what? Just continue praying in tongues. Continue. Don't stop. So now I want to pray for the sick now. The miracle service will start now. It's after the miracle service that I will give you such as I have. Yes. And you have the license to do the things that you have seen me do. If you are still here, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. 